Good afternoon. I'd like to call the meeting of the Johnson County Community College Board of Trustees to order uh, for September 2017. Please help me start the meeting by uh, reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you. As we get started, I'll note Trustee Cross uh, may be showing up during the meeting. He had a, an out-of-town court appearance as a lawyer and is trying to get back in for the meeting. Um, I also want to welcome Dr. Weber and Karen to our, the front dais, uh, two of our vice presidents. Uh, it is fitting, I think, that we uh, have you up here so that you can help us um, understand things and ask questions, and I appreciate the fact that our staff in the audience now has a table in front of them so they can actually um, help to do their job a little more conveniently. So um, welcome to the front. You do have to stay awake more when you're up here than when you're out in the audience. Uh, next item on the agenda, I'm going to uh, announce the presence of a quorum. Ms. Schleist, I did that last month for the first time in my year and a half as chair, even though it's in the minutes every meeting, we have a quorum. Um, and the next item is roll call and recognition of visitors, Terry. So this evening's visitors include Dick Carter, Roberta Eveslage, Bill Henderson, Catherine Scent, Leland Scent, Alice Ludlow, Angelina Lawson, Paul Snyder, Matthew Courtney, and Gary Anderson. Welcome. Uh, next item is the open forum. The open forum is a, is a period of time when the community or anybody can, can address the board. There will be one open forum session during each board meeting. Uh, the c comments are limited to five minutes unless there are a large number of speakers, in which case the chair has the opportunity to reduce the amount of time to less than five minutes. In order to be recognized, our speakers are asked to sign in at the, at the uh, dais outside the, outside the meeting before the open forum agenda item. When addressing the board, registered speakers are asked to remain at the podium uh, to be respectful and are encouraged to address individual personnel or student matters directly with the appropriate college personnel. As a matter of rule, the, the board does not respond uh, to issues or uh, of personnel or student matters um, or matters that are being addressed through the college's uh, organized grievance or other review processes. Um, there is nobody who signed up tonight uh, to speak at the open forum session, so we'll move on to awards and recognitions. Dr. Sopcich. Thank you, Mr. Musil. Um, tonight we have a couple of awards and recognitions um, related to our Vol Stars organization. Bob, um, how would you like to do this? Obviously, we haven't rehearsed. You'd like to come up and have the podium. I would, I would like to do that. Bob, this is Bob Potemski. Bob oversees the Vol Stars, which is our volunteer group that uh, works in our performing arts venues. Bob, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President, Chairman Musil, trustees, friends, neighbors, faculty, and staff. Um, I'm here today to introduce to you three very, very important people, people who have made, are making, and will continue to make tremendous positive contributions to the Carlson Center, to the college, and to the work that we do here as a whole. As you know, the Ball Stars are our committed, dedicated, tireless volunteers who make everything that we do at the Carlson Center possible. One of the many functions that they perform is operating a complimentary coat check service for our Carlson Center guests. While the service they provide is free, they do collect and even solicit donations of any amount with the intent of earmarking those funds specifically to a scholarship fund. The Volstar Theater Scholarship is awarded each year to a second year student selected on the basis of demonstrated talent, academic achievement, and commitment to the theater program. This year's winner, Michael Polilaev, is someone who embodies all of these criteria. He's a talented actor, with his long-term sights set on a role in an ensemble television comedy. He is a gifted musician who plays in the jazz band and the concert band, and has received a music scholarship as well. Uh, he's, carrying a, he's a true scholar, carrying a class load for a double major, and in his spare time, he works at Ikea. So, his vision is clear. He is. Uh, set his sights on attending the University of Idaho for a bachelor's degree and an MFA after he completes his studies here. And so it's no wonder that Michael was selected for this year's Volstar Theater Scholarship, or why one of his mentors, 
Professor Beati Pettigrew said that she was absolutely certain that Michael will be successful wherever his journey takes him. And we can be certain that wherever he does land, Michael will do, as an alumnus, do a spectacular job of representing Johnson County Community College. And Michael would like to say a few words to us. Please welcome Michael Polarayev. Hello. Um, my name is Michael Polev, as Bob has said. Um, I just want to say a couple thank yous and uh, a couple, uh, share a couple thoughts of my end. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the Volstars uh, as an organization. Um, as a theater student, we see them at every single show. Every single show, they help us volunteer, they help show us the ropes, understand and show us what professionalism looks like, and it's a blessing to have them. Nextly, I'd like to thank the department itself, uh, the entire fine arts department, uh, recording arts, theater, music. Um, I've got a foot in a lot of it, and I can see a lot of the aspects, and I'm truly grateful that um, Johnson County has this uh, opportunity for students to pursue not only academics, but also the fine arts and the, um, the artistic side of learning. Um, and then uh, Johnson County in general. Uh, I think this school is fantastic, and I have enjoyed every single moment that I've been here. Uh, and I can't wait to finish and go on and be a representative of what it means to be a part of Johnson County. Um, thank you. Hold on, Michael. Michael, two questions, two questions. It <clears throat> says here for the scholarship, you have to do a talent audition or a portfolio review. Mm -hmm. Which one did you do? Uh, I did a talent audition. And what did you do? Um, I performed a monologue and a song. Uh, and for the directors, for all the uh, faculty directors. Could, could, I have to, could you give us a 15 seconds? <laughs> 15 seconds. Yeah. Um, uh, I can, I'm working on a Shakespeare piece right now, so Excellent. I can give you a little bit of that. Excellent. I know that virtue to be in you, Brutus, as well as I do know your outward favor. Well, honor is the subject of my story. I cannot tell you what other men think of this life, but for, for my single self, I had as life not be as to live in awe of such a thing as myself. I was born free as Caesar, so were you. And we both have fed as well, and we can both endure the winter's cold as well as he. <laughs> Why, why the University of Idaho? Um, it was given to me as a strong recommendation from Beatty Pettigrew, um, and we in the department consider her like a mother. She, has, she coaches us and she gives us direction, and it's not hard to trust her. So with that, I will give it a look this, uh, this fall and confirm what I already believe to be a good choice. That's great. Thank research. you, Mike. Thank you. It would be great, I think, if Michael could come back and visit JCCC as a performer on the Yardley Hall stage sometime. I'm sure he would delight our guests. But in a different and equally important way, the next two people you'll meet have been delighting Carlson Center guests for a combined total of over 22 years. Catherine and Robert Sint have been Volstars since 2006. They very quickly established themselves as two people who are always willing, more than willing even, to take on additional responsibility. They have served on the Arts Education Committee for 10 years, and Robert is the go-to photographer for the Arts Education Program. In addition to performing their standard ushering and ticket scanning duties, you're likely to find the two of them helping out in the office or minding the information desk at the Nerman Museum. You may find Robert teaching computer classes as he's been employed here for 27 years. And when you visit the Cowboy Jubilee this uh, September 30th, you'll find Catherine on the second floor demonstrating old-time quilting methods as part of an educational display and class. Since they've joined the Ball Stars, Robert and Catherine have combined to provide nearly 3,000 hours of volunteer service. And while it would be simple to assign a dollar value to those hours and do some multiplication, merely considering Robert and Catherine's contribution in those terms would far underestimate the value of what they provide to our guests and their co-volunteers. The care, the attention, and the sincerity with which they address every guest with whom they come in contact is exemplary. They are stellar representatives of the Ball Star program, the Carlson Center, the college as a whole, and each one of us individually. There are a couple I am proud to have on my team, and we are beyond fortunate to count them among our supporters. Please welcome Robert and Catherine Sint.
we both grew up with a background in the arts. Robert would draw on any little scrap of paper that he had at hand, which led to teaching in junior high, and then to his marriage of his love for art to the technology at, here at Johnson County Community College, um, as well as his photography hobby. I started at a very young age producing backyard performances in front of my grandfather's flower arch. Uh, that blossomed into music lessons and solo performance in musicals and operas. Um, when we first started as volunteers, Roxanne Hillman took us under her wing, taught us to serve the arts with her extraordinary grace and dignity. Roxanne introduced us to Angel and the arts education program. And since that time, all of the leaders that we've worked with in the arts education program and the performing arts program have helped us to grow and to blossom. We support the arts because education needs STEAM. Science, technology, engineering, and math is just a stem without a flower. You would never consider giving your heart, your sweetheart, a bouquet of stems. We need to give our youth our greatest resource, the flowers that are the arts, to complete their education. Um, I think I know quite a few faces here, and I think some of you know me. As uh, Bob said earlier, I've been associated with college now for close to 30 years. Um, it's hard, well, I retired four years ago. In June, in July, I got a phone call said, will you teach this class this fall? <laughs> and then a week later, I got another phone, we've got another class, can you take it as well? Um, I, just, I just find it hard to leave this campus. It's a great place to be. You know, uh, it's been, well, I guess about 11 years ago now, but we were attending a, a Garrison Keillor concert. And, uh, and we were seated by a Volstar. Um, and they, it happened to be some aisle seats we were in that we'd purchased. And the Volstars would kind of line up next to us to greet the next um, people, uh, next guests. And uh, I got kind of, bold and start up conversation with them because it just seemed like they were having a good time. And I thought to myself, well, I'd like to have a good time too. So we started talking about what it was to, what it meant to them to be a Volstar. Her answers were just so perfect and she was so courteous and I just had to, had to turn to my wife and say, let's do this. And so we did. And uh, we've never regretted it since. So just, like I say, a great opportunity. Uh, in short, then, I'd simply like to say thank you for honoring us with this Volstar Award of the Year. Um, but I have to give credit not only to uh, our fellow Volstars, but as, as Catherine said earlier, Roxanne Hillman and now Bob. Um, he's continuing on where Roxanne Got us off to a good start, but you know he's great to work with too. Our uh, fellow Vol stars, then as well, uh, we'd really like to talk about them. But it, it it's a, a great time to be able to come here to the campus, to the college, and greet the community and make them welcome. So we thank you for that opportunity. You know, thank you um, for your service. I also know that you have an extraordinary family, um, which is perhaps um, I, your greatest accomplishment. And, and congratulations on that one. I know you have a son in the audience and a grandson. Leland, why don't you come on up here? We'll make it a family affair. There you go. There you go. All right. Is it Carter? Is it Car Car Carter? Car Does he have anything to say? <laughs> That's good. good job. All right. 
Thank you, Sense. Fantastic. Thank you. It is amazing each year to think about how much the Vol, Vol Stars do for the college and the recipients of this award every year uh, are, are exemplary um, leaders in that group. The amount of hours that they provide to the college, I think the last time I saw it's in excess of $200,000 worth of, of volunteer service. We couldn't do the performing arts series, we couldn't do a lot of the things we do in Yardley Hall, Carlson Center, Polsky Theater, Black Box if we didn't have Vol Stars. So please thank the rest of your members uh, for all the service that they provide to the college. I think it's hotter than blazes in here. If anybody wants to take off their jacket, please feel free to do so. I did. The president won't. He'll show off how cool and calm he is. Uh, <laughs> but it is boiling up here in the front. If anybody has control of the thermostat and fixes it, they will be part of the bond proceeds later. will go directly <laughs> to them. We are working on Okay. The next item on the agenda is the college lobbyist report, so let's raise the heat a little bit and bring Mr. Carter to the podium. Welcome, Nick. Tonight I'll uh, begin my report uh, much like I do every time I uh, stand up here and give you a report with a brief state general fund update. And you may have wondered in the past, uh, why does he always start his reports that way? I hope tonight that it will become um, very clear why, why I do that. And, uh, and I'll touch back on that point a little bit later uh, as I'm making a couple of uh, comments about some of the action that occurred today at the Board of Regents uh, meeting. The first two months of the fiscal year, uh, are ahead of pace, uh, about uh, $8.5 million each month uh, for a total of about $17.5 million uh, for the month ending August. I have no reason to believe that we won't be on pace for September either. Uh, I think things are, um, are moving in the right direction. Keep in mind, though, that we're still dealing with the, um, the revenue estimates that were revised in November of 2016 and April of this year. Uh, we'll have another uh, consensus revenue estimating group meeting a little bit later in November, again, to see if things are uh, on the right track for uh, the budget preparations and discussions for fiscal year 2019. Uh, that, that again, will all, all begin when the legislature returns in January of next year. Uh, I don't know that we can actually point to any of the policy changes that have uh, taken place uh, as a result of, of legislative activity. Uh, this past session is the reason that those numbers are up. Um, a lot of the uh, individual income tax uh, payers and or the withholdings are not flowing through in these reports just yet. Uh, but those increases did take place beginning uh, July 1 of this, this year. So we'll, we'll know a little bit more. I think the revenue estimating group will, will be able to paint a little bit better picture in November of just exactly where they think things are, are going. To that uh, tune, uh, the Legislative Budget Committee will be meeting October 5th. They've not met yet. Uh, in fact, very few of the interim committees have met yet this fall. And it, of note that, that I'll be paying attention to when, when they come together in Topeka in October is a review of the new K-12 um, school finance formula. Uh, I think they'll be taking a look at uh, how has it worked in various parts of the state. Um, if you follow the news or if you pay attention to um, uh, K-12 funding, you'll know that some districts are pleased uh, with the way the, uh, the new formula, or, or I, sh I don't know if I want to say pleased, they are not um, unhappy with the, the rollout of the new formula. There are those, however, who, who were losers uh, in as far as dollars flowing to, to their districts. And so I think that, that that is one of the things that the committee will be reviewing. The, uh, the other thing that we're, we're waiting on is the, uh, the school fund funding formula, the adequacy piece from the Kansas Supreme Court, and, and again, your guess is as good as mine or, or anyone's on when that decision will actually be released. That will have a, a large impact on how the budgeting process uh, moves forward. So I tell you all of that because today the Board of Regents took action on uh, their budget requests as well as making it a, a priority. Uh, for all of the system, all of the institutions that, that uh, come under the umbrella of the Board of Regents. And I've included some, uh, some attachments in the report that, uh, that you can follow along with and or um, I can point out different things uh, on them if, if you're uh, curious. But I think it's important to note that 
uh, for the first time in a long time, uh, if not ever, the board is, is very serious about all of higher ed coming together with one voice. Uh, and in order to do that, they've determined that um, the priority for higher education this year should be the restoration of the 4% cuts that were made last year. That looks different at different institutions, uh, whether you're a state, in, uh, state university, whether you're a two-year, uh, whether you're a technical college. And so I think everyone being able to get around the table on that particular piece in and of itself is, is a feat. Um, interestingly, there, there were some, and, and then the other piece of that would be the uh, restoration of the CTE funding um, for the for the students that participate in those programs, and that's about a $4 million mark. So we're talking about $23.9 million for the, the entire system of higher education, of, of which our cut is about $826,000 or so. Uh, that, that's a, a rough estimate of, of what that number looks like that we would see uh, back if, if the funds were restored in fiscal year 2019. Uh, again, it's going to be a fluctuating number uh, out of the $4 million from that, uh, that CTE funding. Then they draw a line, uh, but, there, but there was another item above that line, and I think it's worth mentioning because we've not seen um, a institu an institution-specific request above the line in the past uh, when you're talking about the entire system. And, and so there was a, a great uh, debate, if you will, um, at the Board of Regents this morning on a particular item related to uh, a $535,000 request for a nursing program at Emporia State. Um, everything leading up to today or until the, the agenda was published, uh, it was our understanding that that item would, would be listed under, under the line with the rest of the enhancements for higher education. And we have some under there as well. And uh, that was not the case when the agenda came out. However, um, after the discussion this morning, uh, and it was robust, um, the, the decision was made to focus solely on the restoration of the 4% cuts as well as the money uh, returning for the CTE piece. Um, the, money, the money for the uh, nursing program uh, at, at Emporia had been private, and so they were looking to backfill that with, um, with state general fund dollars. So again, these are all important pieces of why I give the, uh, the general updates on, on what the budget looks like. So, what we'll see in the enhancement piece would be full funding of the gap for the tiered technical courses. And again, that number is going to fluctuate. It's about $6.8 million spread across, but depending on, on how that's divided out based on the formula or the number of students participating in the program. Uh, and then a $2 million or a 2.5% increase for non-tiered courses. And that would become a part of the base. That, again, those two items for the two years are listed under the enhancements. Now, there's a, ho a whole big list for, for all the institutions, and you can look at that and see if you have a favorite one from, from your alumni organization or, or, or whatnot. But the important piece there is, in its discussion, the board said that institutions or organizations could actively support or lobby those other items under the enhanced list as long as it didn't take away from the base funding. We have uh, PAYGO rules in some committees, uh, at the, in some budget committees at the State House. That means if you appropriate money one place, you have to take it from another place. So that's going to be interesting to see how that particular piece unfolds. The, the key piece here is the 4% restoration is the priority. The other key um, proposals uh, are not considered Board of Regents priorities. Now the other, the other interesting thing is, is that the Board of Regents will uh, listen to non-budget legislative proposals at their November, November meeting, which will be in Wichita. Uh, again, that's, that's a couple of months off. Right now, I'm not aware of anything significant that is going to be reviewed, but we'll continue to, to be watching what those items are. And I'm not, I'm not aware of anything at this point coming from the um, Community College Association um, as far as a legislative initiative that would be uh, requested or reviewed through the board process. The, um, so I, I hope that, that that all kind of sinks in because what we see playing out, and you're already seeing it probably in your mailbox, there are groups that will send out postcards about budget busters or people that, that voted to increase your, your taxes or less money in your wallet. Uh, <coughs> there's going to be additional efforts from, from folks to say that there's plenty of money uh, already in state government uh, and that, that 
cuts don't need to be restored. And so, again, that's why I paint the picture so that we can see where we fall in that particular mix. The, uh, the other thing that uh, is, is in the works and, and planning is underway, uh, last year was the first year that we had a higher education day uh, at the State House where all of the coordinated and governed institutions uh, came together, set up tables and displays, uh, mascots came, there were showcased uh, different uh, specialties from, from different schools. That will be occurring again on January 18th. Uh, of this year, of the, of the coming year, rather, uh, in this, in when the legislative session kicks off. And so once again, we'll be participating in, in that event, uh, and, and certainly anyone is welcome. Uh, it starts with a breakfast at 7 a.m. for legislators, and it usually concludes, or last year, I say usually, uh, we've only done it one year, uh, it will conclude around 2 o'clock. Um, that is a board day, both for the Board of Regents as well as for um, the college here. And, uh, and so it kind of fits nicely if folks are going to be in, in Topeka for the, the Board of Regents meeting. The other, uh, the other item that, that I would mention, and it's not included in, in your report, is that uh, I will be, I, I'm a member of a business coalition, uh, immigration, a business immigration coalition. And that group kind of meets as needed uh, off and on. They've been, they've been together for uh, seven or eight years or so. And uh, that group will be uh, having a conference call here in, in the coming week or so uh, to talk about some of the significant issues that are going on uh, nationally. They will be talking about DACA and, and the DREAM Act, as well as several um, worker-related um, bills that, are, that are, have either been introduced or, or are being talked about in Washington, D.C. And so again, we find ourselves um, with that back and forth between the state and between the federal government as it relates to um, immigration issues. And so I'll, I'll give you an update next month on, on what comes of that. This is purely an informational call at this point, but usually the action items come after that. So I would stop there, um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, and, and answer questions as I'm able. Questions? Trustee Lindstrom? The, uh, Mr. Carter, the, the revenue numbers that you <coughs> mentioned, are they reflecting comparisons to projected estimates? or are they actual comparisons to last year's? The, the numbers in the tables that I've provided, yeah. those are based off of 2017 and 2016 uh, numbers. Estimate. So those are, ac no, those are actual Actions. numbers. Okay. Those are actual numbers. <clears throat> Any other questions? If not, thank you for your report. I know you'll follow the interim committees for us, and I, you've already identified a couple of issues in higher ed that in, in last month's report, I think. Yes. So. Thank you very much. Well, next, we'll move on to committee reports and recommendation. Uh, the management committee had a full month. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Cook. After hearing Robert's and Catherine's comments, I have no report. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, We're going to stop putting the awards and recognition at the start of the agenda because it's downhill. Well, I, I uh, Catherine and Robert, thank you very much. Uh, Wait I think a I we have bond, bond people here and bond lawyers. This has <laughs> got to be exciting. I think I heard right, Robert well. say, and at least I interpret it this way, I'd rather be up here talking about my Volstar colleagues than receive this recognition. And I think to both of you that's really a statement of who you are as people and uh, the warmth you give to the guests that we have to this campus. So thank you very, very much. We did meet on uh, Wednesday, September 6th. Uh, we had a number of reports, and before we get to the recommendations, I would like to say that Dr. Jay Antle, Executive Director of the College of Center for Sustainability, uh, highlighted progress made uh, through the sustainability efforts, college's power switch program specifically, and uh, throughout his work, this, uh, throughout the work of the sustainability department, and in correlation, in correlation <coughs> with Rex Hayes and our staff, uh, our college continues to receive national recognition. I'd just like to take a moment to point out a couple of, of uh, points about that report. Um, uh, in our goals, 50% of the landfill diversion by 2016, that has been completed, so we're meeting that particular goal. <coughs> Zero waste to landfill by 2025, we're on course to, uh, I think, meet that goal. 15% renewable energy on the campus by 2020 and 100% renewable by 2050. And I don't know about you, Mr. Chair, but I don't know that I will be on the board in 2050, but you might. And uh, it would be interesting to see if we achieve that, of that goal. Uh, a couple of other uh, comments uh, I would make. Uh, campus electricity usage has really, since 2007, 2008, uh, been going down, up a little bit in 13, 14. 
but 1617 has been the lowest usage the campus has utilized since 2007-2008, and our annual electricity expenditure um, has been relatively flat since 2007-8, up in 12-13, up in 13-14, uh, but again, since 1314, gradually uh, being re reduced. Um, interestingly, since 2008, rate hikes have gone up 97%, 8% uh, average every year since 2008. Uh, but the campus's electricity usage has dropped 30% since 2008. Um, and I, I would like to just point out that uh, two things. I, I think Dr. Antel. Uh, made a great point of talking about the integration that we have made on this campus with, uh, with departments and faculty. And a slide that he referenced, I think, indicated that we have 200 faculty that in some shape or form have, um, have taught their courses in relationship to some ad advent of sustainability. And we, we have a large number of students that through that coursework has participated in making this campus kind of a, an environmental uh, living campus as it, re, as it refers to sustainability. So the point is that I, I really appreciate how the faculty and the staff have integrated with Dr. Antel and the sustainability team uh, a campus-wide effort to make an impact. And for Rex Hayes and his staff, to, uh, to work in coalition with that. My second point is to thank this board. Uh, you have made some difficult decisions and some bold decisions over time, whether that be for changes in HVAC, whether that be going to LED light bulbs, whether that be going to different control systems. And uh, it's really kind of a team effort. So I just, I just wanted to point that out in a little extra a little extra comment. Barbara Larson, Executive Vice President for Finance and Administrative. By, by the way, on those awards that the college has received on that sustainability, we're competing with, with some pretty big institutions, four-year schools across the country, and we should be proud of that achievement. Barbara Larson, Executive Vice President of Finance and Administrative Services, uh, presented information on recommendation um, to continue using the Form Continuing Education Service Agreement. Uh, training uh, services provided by the college's continuing education division to outside clients for fiscal year 18. Uh, Dr. Larson also reported that the administration uh, intends to extend the contract to Carter Group for one more month. Uh, the, the staff is reviewing uh, some terms of that contract. That contract usually came up at the end of September. But as we review strategies going forward, we, we'd like another month to review that. And we'll bring that contract through the management committee and to the board of trustees in October. Rachel Lears, Associate Vice President of Financial Services, gave the, bud the monthly budget update, uh, indicated that we're beginning uh, the work of the 2016-2017 financial statement uh, audit, and uh, also we're beginning then to gear up for the 2018-2019 budget development, and the cycle continues. And uh, we appreciate the good work that the whole campus does in, re in regard to our budget development. Mitch Borches, Associate Vice President of Business Services, presented the sole source report, as well as a summary of awarded bids between $25,000 and $100,000. And the summary of that report can be found on pages four and five of your board packet. Uh, Rex Hayes gave the campus facilities planning report, services and planning report. And that report is found on page 14 of the packet. And as you can see, uh, the ongoing work of mortar replacement and painting of rails and roof repair and all of that is a year-round process. Next, we have recommendations to present this evening, several of them. The first of two recommendations are related to the College's sale of certificates of participation. You'll recall that last October, uh, this board approved the College Facilities Master Plan, which is an important part of planning for the future and ensuring that our facilities align with student services uh, and support their success. Uh, to that end, proceeds from the sale of these certificates of participation will be used to construct a new career and tech education building and a new arts and design building, as well as renovation of the existing arts and technology building. The uh, master plan calls for proceeds from the capital campaign and use of college reserves to provide funding for the remaining capital projects that we have all approved, as you recall, in Tier 1, and subsequently we'll move into Tier 2. Financial services staff have worked with our financial advisors from Piper Jaffrey and our bond counsel at Gilmore and Bell on this issuance. I'm pleased to report that Moody's Investor Services has assigned a, a, 
I don't know how to say that. Bold A, little A, capital A, small A, one, double A rating to the series. I'll let Mr. Henderson speak to that. To the series 2017 certificates of participation, while at the same time affirming the college's AAA issuer long-term rating as well as the AAA ratings on our outstanding 2016 general obligation bonds in our series 2009 certificates of participation. Earlier today, working with Mr. Henderson from Piper Jaffrey, the college accepted bids for purchase of these certificates. And at this time, I'd like to invite Mr. Henderson to the podium to inform the board of today's proceedings. And while he's coming up, that AAA is a good thing. I will just say that. Bill, please. <laughs> well, thank you very much. That was a great report. Um, the, uh, today was the culmination of work that uh, really began um, in earnest in May. Um, you recall when we uh, met with the board and got the go ahead to proceed with the um, issuance of the certificates of participation. Um, since that time, uh, you know, the thing that, you know, I walk away concerned about is interest rates holding, um, just because that's a long period of time. You know, we're four months later here, and fortunately they did. And uh, so we've got, we had a great outcome today. Um, the bids were received at 10 o'clock this morning. Um, we do it all electronically. And uh, we had seven bids for the, uh, for the certificates, which uh, you have in front of you there. Um, the successful bidder was um, uh, Hilliard Lions, and uh, they're headquartered out of Louisville, Kentucky. And um, uh, we see the other bidders there. That's great interest in the issue, um, $50 million, and we had seven bidders. I think it's an outstanding um, turnout. I, I, uh, um, earlier this morning, my colleague Matt, I, I said, if, if we get five is good and six is great, and we end up with seven. So um, that's, a, that's a great amount of interest in the, uh, in the, college's, um, the college's bond issue. Um, the, um, as Jerry mentioned, uh, we received a AA1 rating for the certificates, which when I met in May, you may recall, I, I thought that would be the outcome, which is still very positive. I think you're, um, uh, the college, as you know, is rated AAA. And uh, because of the structure and the way the Kansas statute works, um, we issue these certificates and the college enters into a 10-year lease. But we have 20-year certificates. So um, and even talking to the analyst, the analyst admitted that when we get to year 10, there's strong likelihood because when the college's lease renews for that final period, which will be 10 years, that um, at that point in time, because the lease matches the term of the bonds, there's some likelihood that you could be looking at an upgrade on the certificates to AAA. So um, just the legal structure what notches us down to the AA1. So it's uh, um, congratulations on a great rating outcome and the reaffirmation of the college's AAA um, issuer rating. Um, so as part of the report, and I, um, uh, the Moody's report, a um, couple things they highlighted. Um, and keep in mind that Moody's is comparing you to their universe of other rated credits. So when they, when they say this, they're, it's in comparison to other um, entities. So um, they, they highlighted the college's sizable and growing tax base, um, strong financial management, healthy liquidity, and low debt burden. So those are, those are the highlights. Um, so uh, I think the college should be um, very proud of the uh, proud of the, rate, the rating outcome. So with the board's approval tonight, um, and you know we're out of the out of the way of interest rate uh, risk, and obviously you've just incurred uh, we're going to be borrowing 20-year uh, capital below three percent. Um, I don't know how many times I can uh, stand up and give you good news on, on interest rates, but it's been going on for a lot of years. Um, the, uh, when we, um, with the approval of the resolutions tonight, we'll be working towards closing on October 4th. And so we're asking you to take, um, adopt a resolution tonight, and I know uh, Gary Anderson with Gilmore and Bell is here tonight as well, if there's any questions on, on the resolution at all. But with that, we'd you know, be just asking you to take action tonight on the resolution. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions for Bill or for Gary? Um, I, I might just ask a question. Our, our low debt burden, Dr. Larson, I, I know we know it, but how low is our debt burden? I mean, our, I think in, in five or 10 years, we would be debt free if we didn't issue these new ones. And it is a very small percentage of the overall, even the budget, let alone the asset. Yes, and our highest debt burden up to this point was in 2005. Um, so with this sale, we would again mirror essentially where we were in 2005, but again, still a very low debt ratio. Our um, principal and interest as a percentage of our total, um, of our, of our total uh, general fund will remain, let's see, relatively low, two, less than 2%, correct? 
of our general fund. And, and Dr. Cook, you may have planned on mentioning this, but this borrowing will not, is anticipated to not include any mill levy increase that will Correct. be funded within the current mill levy. Correct. Okay. Correct. Anything else for our Any other consultant? questions of Mr. Henderson? If not, it is the recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve awarding the sale of the Series 2017 Certificates of, Participa of Participation with principal amount of approximately $50 million to the successful bidder, Hilliard and Lyons, and I'll make that motion. Second. It's been moved and seconded to authorize the sale of the Certificates of Participation. Are there any questions or further discussion? Trustee Lindstrom. Neither, but a comment. Um, Mr. Henderson mentioned part of the reason that the rates are so attractive is financial management of the college, and I think it's appropriate for, for us to recognize both uh, Joe and Barbara for their outstanding work over the last few years to, to get us to that point. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Trustee Lindstrom. Also, Rachel Lears, um, pulling off these bond uh, issues like this is no small feat. I mean, there's a lot of phone discussions, dealing with analysts probably where in Dallas or Chicago, right, right who, who know everything, who are all knowing. Um, it's, it's quite a tribute to our staff to make this happen. So thanks, Dave. Mr. Mr. President, thank you for correcting me because Rachel is a, an important part of that, and I'm sorry I left you out. Other questions or comments? If not, all in favor say yes. Yes. I oppose no. The second recommendation. Motion carries unanimously. The second recommendation, uh, as related to Mr. Henderson's comments, re refers to the resolution, and I will make this motion. It is the recommendation of the management committee that the board of trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to adopt the final resolution authorizing the college to enter into a base lease as lesser and a lease purchase agreement as lessee, for the purpose of providing funds to pay a portion of the costs of various capital improvements and authorizing approving certain other documents and actions in connection with the execution and delivery of said lease purchase agreement, and I'll make that motion. Second. Been moved and seconded to do what Jerry just read. <laughs> I think that's why we need Mr. Anderson here. Uh, this is the way we implement the certificates of participation. Uh, is there any discussion or, or any questions? If not, all in favor say yes. 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 All opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Gary and Bill, thank you very much for your assistance and to the staff. Uh, we're pleased that we can move ahead with this project. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item refers to bids re regarding the annual contract for housekeeping services. Uh, you will find on page six of your document that uh, um, we've notified 19 firms regarding our housekeeping services. Five people responded. You can see the detail of those results. Uh, it is the recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the renewal of the annual contract for housekeeping services with ABM on-site services in the amount of $720,318.12 plus an additional $30,000 for services that may be requested on an as-needed basis for a total annual expenditure not to exceed $750,318.12 and I'll make that motion. Uh, Second. And moved and seconded to accept the annual contract for housekeeping services with ABM on-site services. Any discussion? Not all in favor say yes. 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 Opposed no. Motion carries unanimously. Next item is the annual contract for prime fender, vendor for food. And again, the details of that bid can be found on page uh, seven of your packet. Uh, it is the recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the renewal of the annual contract for prime vendor for food and food supplies with Cisco Food Services of Kansas City, Inc. at an annual expenditure not to exceed $750,000, and I'll make that motion. Second. Moved and seconded to accept the recommendation for the annual contract for prime vendor for food and food supplies with Cisco Foods. Is there any discussion? Not all in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Other than answering details on AA1 rating definition and AAA, that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Yeah, you're out of order. What is the difference, Mr. Chair? Uh, we need to move on with the agenda. <laughs> uh, it looks to me like it's a number one and another little A. <laughs> all right. Thank you. That is an important step for the college. Bill, Matt, and Gary, thank you for helping our team here uh, get that done at a 2.895 <laughs> true interest cost. Uh, you mentioned under 3%. I think 
the public would be pleased to know um, we're borrowing this at 2.895 true interest cost, um, and we will uh, be able to do this with reserves, some private funding, some general funds, and these bonds uh, without a mill levy increase. So thank you, and I will officially release you. You do not need to stay for the rest of the meeting. Uh, thank you for your work. The next item on the agenda is the audit committee. The audit committee report was made last month, but the minutes were not available, so the minutes are at page 17 through 19. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I will move on to the collegial steering report. Any questions on audit committee minutes? Collegial steering committee met uh, whatever the first Tuesday of the month was, and it was our introductory meeting. Uh, the collegial steering committee is made up of the chair and vice chair of the board, the president and vice president of faculty senate, the president and vice president of faculty association, and the chair and vice chair of educational affairs committee, So it is a, as well as the president and members of his cabinet. So it's a great committee made up of trustees, faculty, um, and then members of the administration. Uh, the first meeting is always an introductory meeting, so we didn't, we didn't try to get into any substantive things, but I thought it would be interesting to tell you. We went around and, and uh, figured out some <coughs> things that are unique, maybe interesting about each of us. I'm not going to give any names so everybody can calm down that was there, but here are some things that we learned. Um, we come from all over the country. Uh, one member has six kids. One member paid for college tending bar at, the, at Elks Lodges. One member has visited the state capitals in each of our 50 states. <clears throat> One member lived in the slums of Chile and refereed high school sports. One member was a three-year walk-on at a big eight football school. Two members played serious rugby. One member plays the hammer dulcum. One member was a community college women's basketball coach. And one member had a memorable uh, seasickness trip on a boat in Australia. Uh, I tell you that just because we have a, like this college, we have a huge diversity on that committee. Um, and the one thing we've agreed to in that first committee, I think, and I, everybody came there with the notion that uh, we all have a single goal in mind, which is to help this community thrive. So hopefully more, some, maybe some more substantive discussions as we move forward throughout the year. Human Resources, Trustee Ingram. It's really hard to follow, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Uh, the Human Resources Committee met on Tuesday, September the 5th. We did have a number of very serious short presentations in our report. Uh, Lisa Gartland, Coordinator of Employee Services, provided an overview of the college's hiring and onboarding process. Karen Martley, Vice President, Continuing Education and Organizational Development, gave an overview of all of the awards available to the college's faculty, adjunct, hourly, and salaried staff. John Clayton, Executive Director, Institutional Effectiveness, explained the Higher Learning Commission accreditation process and timeline for their upcoming visit, which will be this coming April of 2018. Becky Sentlever, Vice President of Human Resources, shared an overview of current HRIS systems being utilized in the HR department. And finally, Barbara Larson, Executive Vice President, Finance and Administrative Services, gave an annual report on the Retiree Benefit Trust. The Human Resources Committee reviewed the recommended changes to select policies in the conduct and performance section of the college's policy library and the whistleblower policy, which have been reviewed as a broader assessment of the college's personnel policies and procedures. The recommended updates, including material changes noted in the table, are found on page 23 of the board packet and serve to reorganize and clarify content and bring current the policy language based on present job titles, terminology, and practices. And to my fellow trustees, I would um, have you note that there is an updated version of the proposed dating and relationship policy in the Human Resources Addendum uh, to the board packet, and that is the version that is being recommended for approval tonight, rather than the draft that was originally circulated uh, in our board packet. Mr. Chairman, it is the recommendation of the Human Resources Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve modification to the following policies. Whistleblower, confidentiality, conflict of interest, dating, electronic devices, mandatory training, performance reviews, and personnel records as shown subsequently in the packet. And Mr. Chairman, I will make a motion for the approval of this recommendation. Is there a second? Second. Been moved and seconded to modify the policies as indicated by Trustee Ingram. Any questions or discussion? Not all in favor say yes. 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 Opposed no. <clears throat> Motion carries unanimously. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 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 Thank you,
Okay. He didn't say then he moved. It's been moved and seconded to adopt, adopt the treasurer's report for the month ending July 31, 2017. All in favor say yes. Yes. Aye. Opposed yes. no. Motion carries. One other thing, Mr. Chair, if I can go back. Uh, sure. British libertinism and, and the baboos is, is really quite fascinating and actually remarkably relevant uh, to modern neocolonialism. So I just want to make that comment and welcome any questions anybody might have. <laughs> so. I didn't mean to Dr. Clark it. here or somebody else from the faculty that would like to that question Trustee cool. Cross. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good, good comeback. That concludes my report. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Sopcich, the President's report to Thank the board. You. Thank you, Trustee Musil. Um, you've been sent the monthly report um, to the board. This details uh, an incredible array of activities that are going on campus. I hope you take the time to read this. Before we get to the lightning round, I just have a couple points that I'd like to make. <laughs> Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, outstanding students. You saw Michael up here earlier doing Shakespeare uh, behind the podium, scholarship recipient. Um, we also have great faculty, and together they do projects that are occurring all over the campus, and I'd like to share with you uh, one of them. This one not only uh, um, has taken place on campus, it's also extended its reach to various parts of the United States. Um, we have a student named Graham Murphy. Uh, Graham did an honors project and these are the kinds of honors projects that you like to hear about. Um, he did over the summer, connected to the honors forum. The project was entitled, Causes and Consequences of Ecosystem Collapse. Now, Graham took this project very seriously, so seriously that he raised $4,000 on JCCC UCED, and he took these funds and he purchased <coughs> water filters um, to, for Flint, Michigan. He then traveled to Flint, delivered the filters, and became involved in community outreach and education to build awareness about iron corrosion, lead toxicity, and the importance of safe drinking water. Dr. Cook mentioned this earlier, um, and, and what makes this project so fascinating is that it has broad inter interdisciplinary application as it incorporated environmental science, public health, and social justice. An outstanding project. I'd like to thank Deb Williams for forwarding this to us. You know, there's so many things that go on on campus, um, it's almost impossible to track. And so when somebody sends us the info, um, it's terrific that we can, we can share it with you. May I interrupt? Graham was here earlier, and I, it looks as though I, he left. He was on the back row. I had the opportunity to meet Graham this morning and his partner, Laura Pellegrin, uh, who were interviewing the board chair as part of their honors leadership class and he is a very an outstanding young man went to Shawnee Mission East um, and Laura is a Manhattan high school graduate who intends to be in the state legislature someday so um, they are two people that are in our leadership honors program um, with a very bright future the next point um, I'd like to share with you is that you know recently we've had a member of our faculty uh, featured in the New York Times which is really a, a pretty cool thing um, you may know that recently M.T. Liggett, a Wichita folk artist and provocateur, uh, passed away at the age of 86. M.T. was a gruff-talking, self-taught folk artist whose roadside sculptures, signs, and whirly gigs, uh, this is directly out of the New York Times, by the way, um, <laughs> often carried scabrous, clearly from the New York Times, scabrous <laughs> political messages, and in the process brought him a measure of fame. Regarding his assumed political leanings, um, I'll read this that, he's, that he said. I got this thing about me, he said in Moon Tosser of the Prairie, a 2010 documentary um, about, about him that was produced by Johnson County Community College in Overland Park, Kansas. If you walk up to me and say you're a Democrat, I'm a Republican. If you're a Buddhist, I'm a Shinto. If you're a Catholic, I'm a Protestant. Now, what really was incredible about that line, specifically calling out Johnson County Community College in Overland Park, Kansas. Allison Smith, Allison's our faculty member, chairwoman of the art history department at Johnson County Community College, again, in the article. So Allison <laughs> met him about 10 years ago, and it says here, chairwoman of the art history department at Johnson County Community College, um, and has been his, had been his muse for three sculptures. And this is Allison's quote. The whole cranky persona he had wasn't his real personality, Ms. Smith said in a telephone interview. Once every six weeks, he'd call me, he'd call and say he loved me and that I'm beautiful. And he'd say this with his girlfriend with him. 
<laughs> she, she knew that was how he talked to a friend. I think it's pretty incredible when anyone from our college gets quoted in the Times. It wasn't fake news either, it's the real thing. <laughs> Thank you. We'll now get our lightning round underway. Dr. McLeod. <clears throat> yes, uh, and going back to Dr. Sopcich, uh, discussing Graham and some of our students, one of the great things that's happened thus far as we've gotten into this academic year is, is that uh, Mr. Cross's friends at KU have come to uh, recognize Johnson County greatness once more. Uh, they've come down to talk with us about something that I did not realize was an issue until we started digging into it. Um, students who transfer to KU are often withheld from achieving university honors because the way the honors program is designed at KU requires that you start there as a native student, as a freshman. Um, and seeing the work that our faculty and our students have done over the last year since the collab has been opened and since we've availed uh, the public of so much of the research that our students have been involved in, they actually came calling on us to offer us the opportunity to rework their university honors program in line with our honors program so that our students could garner not just departmental honors, but have an opportunity at university honors um, as they transfer to KU. <clears throat> That made me quite proud, uh, which was only heightened by the fact that while I wish I could claim credit for it, you know, most of the data is from before I got here, our students actually do better than other transfer students throughout the state at almost every uh, four-year transfer institution, as was highlighted today in the transfer and articulation meetings that I attended uh, in Topeka, except for one blemish on our record. Apparently there's too much partying going on in Manhattan. We are, uh, we, 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 we are, base is really high and smart. We, we, we are 0.04 behind uh, one other institution in transfer uh, at K-State and so I, I, I think that, that we're going to have to work on getting our students out of the party atmosphere that, that is bred in Manhattan. For <laughs> shame. <laughs> It's usually after football victories, that's the difference. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mickey. Dr. Weber. Well, as a KU grad, we will have good GPAs because I don't see football victories on the horizon. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to speak briefly to our census enrollment report this evening. Um, we, our census enrollment date, which is the state reporting that we typically do, was uh, completed on Tuesday. Some, some numbers of note are our full-time, or excuse me, our headcount enrollment is down 2.6%, which is uh, 500 students, and I'll talk a little bit about this. And you know, I'm sorry, let's go ahead and pull that down. I, I unfortunately sent Terry uh, an old report as I was hastily trying to do too many things at one time today. So, so I'm just gonna shoot on some of these numbers real quick. Thank you for that and though. Just to clarify, I usually, I usually, I asked Randy about five minutes before five o'clock to do this. So, yeah. <laughs> so, well, I, I apologize nonetheless. Um, so we're down about 500 students. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that is in just one second. Um, particularly what, what, what we look at then are stu entering student populations. So was this year's fall enrollment first time students? Are they retention continuing students? Previously attended JCCC, took a break, transfer. And we saw some really big trends. Uh, every, every student type this fall is down a little bit, except for one, um, and that's continuing students. And I, and I point that out because we've spent a lot of time and effort and energy recently on retention strategies, and I'd like to attribute that, that increase in enrollment of continuing students to retention because historically that's actually been one that's been down. Um, age group wise, our significant decrease um, has been ages 24 to 39. And, and really what we're seeing and we believe is, and it's pretty true to the economy, is, is we're reverse cyclical. Johnson County unemployment is extremely low. And so a lot of adult students who historically have said, I'm gonna go to school and, and work on my job skills and training are probably finding jobs. I think what we wanna do moving forward is look at some of our adult programming offerings and things to make sure that if they're in jobs but they wanna continue education for careers, that we're moving forward with meeting their needs. Our direct matriculators, which would be the 2017 high school graduates who come directly here is pretty flat. So those first time students are about the same. 
Uh, the other, another significant one that's down, that's, that's over, that creates over a full percentage of our being down, is our high school student population. Um, we've got some things that we're going to try to work on in the next couple of days to see what we might be able to do about that. Um, but this number will pro hopefully shift as a result of some of those, those efforts. Um, so we, we are down, but you've heard me say over the last couple of years that um, we're really trying to emphasize not just a census report, though that's kind of our state report, but end of term. A lot of our enrollment over the last number of years has occurred from census till our end of term. We have second eight week classes. We have a couple other offerings. We have career programs that offer interim courses. Uh, last two years we increased our winterum. So we'll continue to bring forward our, our end of term data, but um, our census report is, is what it is for this year. We think that there's some strategies we might be able to deploy to narrow that gap um, by the end of the semester. Randy, across the state, how are there community colleges? It's, it's still early. Everybody's census report was due um, um, Monday, and so we, we, we have to give KBOR a couple days to, to get that in, and I didn't get a chance to, to, to get feedback from other institutions, um, but I, I, I think that will fare fairly well. I will say our local economy is stronger than many of their other local economies, so I wouldn't be surprised, you know, in a number of the schools are trying to build residence halls, which tend to be generators for them at the rurals. So we know in the region, we, we, we heard about the same, but I think um, we, we, John's team asked that and they kind of want to do a little bit of validating before they want us to go on record for what we heard. Trustee Sharp. Quick question, does that 2.6% um, reduction include uh, online students? It does. Actually, we were down in online this semester. Some, some of the places that we were down that, that um, surprised us a little bit, our online enrollment is down a little bit, about 600 hours. Um, this is the first semester we've been down with Hispanic students in quite some time. We've got a lot of efforts going on, and I, I wouldn't be much to persuade me that that maybe our geopolitical or our local, or, or at least our national political scene has impacted Hispanic student enrollment because we, we didn't anticipate that for them. Thank you, Randy. Um, Ms. Marley. I want to share some enrollment numbers as well from continuing education. Uh, one area is our Johnson County adult education, which is our adult basic ed and our English second language students. They are up a little over 2% at this time last year, so we're excited to watch that trend. We think it's due to a couple of things. Um, one of the things we've tried to work with closely is student services as well in, in more of a cohort model for those students. Previously, they've been allowed to come in and take eight hours a week, and they pick and choose when they come in and do that work. Now they are required to be in six hours, whether that's a Monday, Wednesday, or a Tuesday, Thursday, and then they have a choice on how they, what time they come in for the other two hours. Our hope is what we're tracking on that is persistence and completion. We hope we can get those students through and more focused and complete more effectively. Uh, the other thing they've added in that program is learning labs and Friday conversation classes. Those learning labs are at no cost to students who are currently enrolled in those programs where they can come in and work on topics that may not be a part of the curriculum or something they're struggling with. Uh, a big focus we're putting in those is uh, job readiness to help them, whether it's resume, interviewing, those types of things, which has been real popular. The other area, uh, we just got all our summer numbers from our youth programs, which we put more of a focus on, uh, dropping really our, what we would consider our youngest youth programs and put more of a focus on that middle school and high school and, and on our STEM programs to drive them to those STEM programs on into college now and, and at the college. Uh, we, our, our enrollment numbers are finished now. We came in 17% above this time last year. We had waiting lists in 25 of those classes, so what, that gave us a good idea of what <coughs> things we needed to look at for next year. And we believe a lot of that is um, as a result of other things going on here, Girls Who Code, uh, some of the, the mentoring that goes on on the Healthcare IS program, people that are working with KC Tech as well in mentoring some of the students. So, um, and, and out of those, 35% were returning students over time. So we were trying to benchmark at about 45%. So we were real happy with that and had a real good mix in male-female right at 45, 55%. So uh, we're very pleased with those results. 
Thank you, Karen. You know, the past, uh, a week ago, we had uh, Secretary of Education, Bessie DeVos, on campus. Um, we had some pretty good coverage of that. I've asked uh, Mr. Gray here to give us an overview, some perhaps can share with us a strategy of, getting those, of putting those together, and also to share with us um, some information about the safe finger. Yeah, we've got another of the videos really to talking from the standpoint. Um, obviously, we have a Secretary of Education, um, especially if this is boss, that there comes some controversy. Um, and it's really easy to get wrapped up in really the political aspect and hard to control the message. So the college made a really conservative effort, um, really from the get-go, on extreme short notice of, of how we can leverage this to really position the college. And that really was putting what matters first, which is students. So how can we prop up and really showcase our students on a day-to-day -day basis? And second is how do we leverage the college? You know, showcase what we do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, around creativity, around innovation, whether that be faculty, staff, um, and administration with that. Um, and that's no easy effort um, with media. Um, they're constantly looking for controversy and they're constantly looking for a negative. So that was a concerted effort um, and I'm gonna really let the videos play and showcase this. We're going to have two videos that really showcases the students and really I think that message that any of you saw really followed through with this visit. And then the last um, video was on the safe finger and this actually came from the media's visits here for Secretary DeVos um, and the staff. Um, it was a huge effort and we were very intentional on how to leverage the media and this uh, last video with the safe finger is really a spin-off of that because they really got exposed and it was a great thing of all the different aspects that the college offers. Um, and the safe finger is just one from an innovation standpoint that really showcases where we are on the map compared to other colleges around the area. Since her confirmation eight months ago, the U.S. Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, has consistently said that the nation's approach to education needs to change. She has also consistently continued her support for expanded school choice. Today, she brought that message to the state of Kansas. U.S. Education Secretary Betsy DeVos capping off her third day of a nationwide tour here at Johnson County Community College. She says that she chose to visit this school because of their forward thinking. The focus is on actually, on this tour, really visiting schools that are doing things creatively and innovatively and with, a, with an eye to the future. You're going to tired, how are you? School leaders honored by her visit. I, I feel very proud to be a member here and faculty member at Johnson County Community College. I think she got a better understanding of community colleges in general. Is it? Ooh, controversy. <laughs> because um, a lot of her views aren't exactly popular. It was also not without detractors. Some students say they're glad they got to showcase what a public school can offer. Here at a public school, she just saw that we have a really great institution here, and we're actually able to affect a lot of uh, great students. DeVos, an ardent supporter of school choice in expanding the voucher program, responding to some criticism that she does not pay enough attention to public schools in the country. I would hope that we could focus less on what word comes before school and more on what we need to do to meet the needs of all individual, individual students. Although all the students here did not share the same views as Betsy DeVos, they say they are glad to meet with her and they hope that she walked away with a better understanding of how a public community college can change so many lives. Haley. School leaders say that they're proud of the way all the students, faculty and staff handled themselves during the secretary's visit today. Chance, though, outside Johnson County Community College today, dozens protesting the secretary's visit and her policies. Secretary of Education headed back to college today. The lesson what's going on right now at Johnson County Community College. 41 Action News reporter Ariel Rothfield shows us what students wanted her to learn during the visit. Ariel. Yeah, Rianne and Secretary Betsy DeVos chose Johnson County Community College to highlight its jobs training program and praise the community college for its flexibility. It's a safety circuit. At Johnson County Community College, students found a unique visitor roaming the halls. U.S. Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos making JCCC part of her Rethink Schools tour. Every single student is special and unique and we need to be focused on ensuring that they have the opportunity to develop themselves to their fullest potential. Her first stop, the school's automotive and technology shop, where students like Daniel Ward are diagnosing headlight problems on this car. His message to the secretary, the importance of technical degrees. This is something tomorrow one of 
us could get a job in easily. Next on the tour, a visit to the school's nursing building, touring the healthcare simulation lab and speaking with students like Johnny Carter. With all the technology, we get that real life experience um, with patient care. This multi-state tour is designed to highlight innovative and creative programs, like JCC's Culinary Institute, the final ingredient on Thursday's tour. I think it's important that we, we realize how much uh, funding for our education and the specialized programs really help people get that extra step and succeed. We're in front of students, DeVos reaffirmed her commitment to career and technical education, despite her agency's proposal of $160 million in cuts to those programs. We have a very clear focus on creating and, and communicating multiple pathways to higher education and to opportunities beyond high school. DeVos is scheduled to visit Kansas City Academy in Waldo tomorrow. We're told some parents will join some organizations and protest her position on school choice, vouchers, and more, similar to what a group of about 50 did here today. We are live in Johnson County, Ariel Rothfield, 41 Action News. All right. If it wasn't already, Johnson County Community College is on the map. At universities across the country are pointing out the benefits of the college's newest and most unusual product fake fingers. The healthcare students at JCCC are using the plastic fingers during simulation labs. Those fingers hold liquid to simulate drawing blood for glucose testing while protecting the patient's hand from puncture. Most patients admitted to the hospital will have their glucose tested. Before the college developed this product, nursing students were unable to test a patient's glucose realistically. They really have to be serious and they have to have good technique. Uh, and to be able to fill that the test strips adequately and to be able to get a number. The SA Finger Stick was funded, developed, and marketed by students and staff at JCCC. University of North Carolina, Texas Tech University, and the University of Kansas have purchased and are currently using the fake fingers. Isn't that cool? Very. Johnson County Community College. All Doing good man. work. Those were the lead stories, I think, at 6, uh, 9, and 10 o'clock news. And the way, they, the way the college is positioned in those um, is kind of remarkable considering all the other stuff that swirls around a uh, Betsy DeVos visit. So hats off to our team across the whole campus. I mean, that was a campus-wide effort to make that happen. So that concludes the report. Thank Questions? you. Questions? Dr. Cook and then Trustee Cross. Uh, not a question, a comment. Uh, years ago, I was teaching sixth grade in Grand Forks, North Dakota, and I was using the newspaper in the classroom. And in the training program, I, was, I, I always remember a, a comment by the publisher of the Detroit Free Press. And he said this, if we ever put out a newspaper on any given day and do not receive any calls from the public, we've put out a bad newspaper. Because our business should be about challenging the reader with thought. And if we go back to our democracy, uh, the whole point was that if we don't have an educated citizenry, our democracy won't be as effective as it could be. So I'm driving to Tennessee Thursday morning last week at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I get a text from a good friend of mine who's a board member of a college in Missouri. And he said, is it true that the Secretary of Education is going to be on your campus? And what he was really saying is, do you know about that, and do you approve of such things? <clears throat> so I responded to him uh, by text to say, um, when we fail to listen and educate, we fail. Higher education is about the process of presenting all points of view on an issue. And, and when we fail to do that, we have let our students down. And um, by the way, the Department of Education chose our school because of our innovation. I'd remind the public that we were a founding school of the League of Innovation when the League started several years ago. And I think our college has continued in that theme throughout. Uh, its existence. So uh, I'm pleased that, uh, oh, and then I also said, and we're proud that she'll have an opportunity to listen to our students. So, so I guess what I'm trying to say to all of us, and I need to work on this myself, is to be a better listener, to become educated on all points of view, uh, and, can, and control our emotions within so we can make better decisions. So I want to compliment Chris. I, I know that a lot of that um, public relations uh, reports that we had uh, rely upon a lot of work by you and your staff. And uh, I'm just proud of this college 
that we gave our students a chance to engage with the Secretary of Education. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Trustee Cook. Uh, I will say that I just listened to you, and I agree with the vast majority of what you said. And while many of us, and uh, I could name on one hand the number of people happy about uh, the Secretary's presence, uh, I was proud of how the college handled it and how Chris's staff uh, handled everything. And, uh, I'll be quiet because I'll endorse the rest of Trustee Cook's comments. Any other comments? I have a comment. Yes, <coughs> Trustee Sandate. I just want to say <clears throat> what a wonderful opportunity uh, for our institution and our community and our, uh, our professors and our leadership. But I think equally also, what, an awful, what a wonderful opportunity for our students to see our leaders conduct themselves in a way that we all should conduct ourselves when we, when we encounter somebody that we don't agree with. And I would also say that there's people on this campus that probably do agree with Betsy Boss, DeVos. But the realities are that we can be civil about it and we can glean and learn from the opportunity. And I think it sets the example that we can receive future leaders and all sorts of people on this campus with different ideas that may be opposed to ours, but the reality is that we can learn, we can grow, and we can be better for it. So I just want to compliment Johnson County Community College, Chris Gray, uh, the leadership, because uh, it was just a, a wonderful opportunity, and I was just excited to see Johnson County Community College get all the recognition. Thank you. Um, I, I was asked this morning by Laura Pellegrin in the interview whether it made a difference to have the Secretary of Education here. And in, kind of in the macro sense that, you know, if, if we as Johnson County Community College, one of the greatest community colleges in the country, if, if we couldn't make a difference um, with her being here and her views of higher education, public, private, whatever, um, I just want to know, did, do you think it made a difference? And I, what I said was, I know if she hadn't been here, we wouldn't have had a chance to make a difference. And so that's why I think it was so important to have her here. She saw what a public institution can do to create low cost, quality education for students to learn skills and get jobs. Um, and I think she understood that we can't do that without the support of the state and federal government. Uh, we can't do it without Pell Grants. We're an economic engine. We lift people out of poverty and socioeconomic straits. And I don't know whether she left here thinking that that might change some education policy or her members of the staff left that way. But if she hadn't seen that, she would have not seen what we can do. Um, and so that to me is worth it. And I, you know, Joe and Chris and Kate and everybody, Mickey and Chief Russell, the security issues I know were, were paramount. Um, throughout that process and I don't I don't gonna leave so I know we're gonna leave somebody out, but thank everybody for what they did. Thank you. Yeah. That wraps up the report. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not aware of any old business uh, or new business, so we'll move to reports from faculty liaison and Dr. Arjo. Already behind in grading yet? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Make this, make this quick. Um, no, I thank you as always. I always appreciate the opportunity to uh, address the board administration. A um, couple things. Uh, we did have our first meeting of the year uh, about three weeks ago. Um, it was a lengthy meeting. We had a lot of uh, different announcements and presentations from various people. I just want to mention one. John Clayton came and presented to the faculty the results of the Noel Levitt survey, the same results you saw at the board meeting before. And I want to thank him again because one thing I've concluded is a very thankless task is to try to present data and statistics to faculty about faculty. <laughs> so it led to a lively discussion, which I think was uh, an interesting and, and valuable one. Um, our next meeting is next Thursday at 3.30, GEB 3.42. So as always, I just got an invitation to board members, administration. Uh, we always like to have uh, people come. Uh, secondly, just a quick announcement. I can't get into the the juicy part of it, but as you have heard, we do have a political action committee that operates somewhat separately from the main uh, governing organization of the FA. And I would also like to stress that it does not use any dues money, but we do um, 
again, in the business of endorsing candidates for the Board of Trustee election. Um, so we met this morning to take the recommendations from that uh, pack, and we have made some decisions. I'm not going to announce them for a couple reasons, one of which I haven't had a chance to talk to the candidates yet about who we will endorse, but uh, that should be coming soon, and you might look for announcement to that effect um, probably tomorrow or um, soon after that. Uh, lastly, I also wanted to say something about the visit by the Secretary of Education. Um, I was invited to be a part, and I do appreciate the invitation. However, I was out of the country at the time, so I was not able to take part. I think Ron Paulsick, um, a past president, attended in my stead. Um, this did occasion some discussion among faculty. There was some uh, discussion about how we should respond and some questions about the college doing this. Um, there's, you know, obviously for the reasons I've been already pointed to, she is a controversial figure and this is because of, among other things, her policies or recommendations regarding um, alternate types of schooling and some doubts about her commitment to public education. Um, I would ask, also add there's some concern about her <coughs> announced intentions to revise the Title IX um, investigation guidelines. That was also causing a lot of uh, discussion. So certainly there was a position out there that maybe Johnson County Community College as a public institution should not be giving her a platform given her controversial status and in the eyes of some given her um, hostility or at least less than friendly attitude towards public education. Um, and that's a view I respect. So I certainly can understand why someone would take that position. I think in the limit there's probably is a point at which you don't want to provide platforms for extremely controversial people. Uh, I would argue at the end of the day that the probably the strongest argument for public education is simply an institution like this and showing people what it does. And so I do think we did a very good job of presenting that to, um, to the public. So let me add my congratulations to everybody who was in part of that. From what I heard, it was a very interesting and pretty substantive uh, event. And if I could also add just a little bit to kind of piggyback on some of the remarks uh, Dr. Cook made. Uh, the reason I wasn't here, I was in a conference in the United Kingdom. Um, at something known as the Manchester Center for Political Theory. It's at the University of Manchester. And so it was a conference drawing international scholars from all over the place, um, very interesting conference. Um, but I had a chance to talk to a young philosopher from Hong Kong. Um, he's now teaching at the University of, um, National University of Singapore slash Yale. So Yale University is collaborating with the National University of Singapore on a program that kind of introduces to Singaporeans uh, some basic concept, based political theory from the West, so liberal democracy and uh, basic human rights, those kinds of ideas. This is uh, interesting for Singapore, if you know the history, it's not always been exactly friendly to those sorts of ideals in its, its government. Um, but it was kind of almost touching that this young Chinese scholar was trying to convince some of us disgruntled down in the dumps, Western philosophers, that the state of democracy in places like the US is actually pretty healthy still, because he looks and he sees we still have our systems of checks and balances, we still have the institutions that, as far as he can tell, coming from places like Hong Kong, Singapore, look pretty healthy still. So I thought that was actually a nice little bit of optimism <laughs> injected to, again, what tend to be rather doom and gloomy kinds of conversations among a lot of us. Um, I did point out to him that these institutions will continue to flourish only so long as political culture remains reasonably healthy to sustain them. And so there I would agree that we really do need to find ways to accommodate those with whom we disagree even quite vehemently. And so there too, I think the college did itself proud in finding a way to bring a country, a country so figure to the college and, and make something very good out of it. So. Great questions for Dennis. Those are great comments. I'm jealous and I want to go with you on your next <laughs> trip. That would be fascinating. Sound like a fascinating conference. Um, uh, the faculty were a big part of her visit and I know it, it was, it, it gave her a platform um, to, to show off in ways that some, some of us may not like or some of us may not agree with, but it, the way it showed off the college uh, is, is, I think, our number one is our number one goal, and I think I think we did that very well. So I really I know that uh, Melanie Harvey was at the reception, and I, Ron Ron was there. Uh, there were other faculty members there from the programs that she had visited. So um, I think it was a it was an all college effort, um, and I, I think particularly the students that talked to her 
were pretty candid about how important it was to them to, to, that something like this is available um, to them. So um, they, she got a good sense that our faculty are just as strong and aggressive and assertive as our students are. Questions? Yeah, Lee. Yeah, uh, Professor Arjo, I, I thank you for the comment on democracy. I think whether it's the switch in time to save nine or the evolution of Abraham Lincoln on certain issues, um, I think uh, I'm, I'm asking you. I think it's important that we actually interact with people to have a chance to show them what we do and educate them. Would you? Absolutely. I think that was in the substance of what right. you said. Right. Yeah. I mean, we could get into arguments with her, and that's important. I applaud the protesters. I think that's a sign of a healthy democracy. Actually, I don't think protests are things we should be concerned with. We should be concerned when there are no protests, because people are afraid to protest. That's when you have <coughs> problems. Yeah, but ultimately, um, I mean, this place is a testament to what public education can be, and what better argument could you ask for? And one other follow-up: how, how is it you can possibly go to Europe so many times? <laughs> That's a good um, question. I... <laughs> it's only twice in the recent. Well, let me take this opportunity to just express my gratitude <laughs> to this. Um, I have talked to faculty at other community colleges who are just astounded at the support we get for this kind of a thing. I've had people say, well, my college won't even send me across state lines to a conference, never mind, uh, to, to another country. So I do think this is just an absolutely wonderful uh, testament to the support we do get from the college. Thank you. Oh, okay, can, we get a, can we get a written transcript of your words? Because <laughs> that was way more eloquent than anything that I was able to do during the whole episode. So thank you very much, Dennis. Those were great remarks. It's on water. It's already gone. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item. Oh, sorry. Yes, Trustee Lister. On that uh, visit uh, topic, I think it's important that we recognize Chief Russell, too, for yeah. The outstanding work that I'm sure none of us are aware of that happened that created the seamless safety that occurred during that uh, event. So I, I want to acknowledge, I think Chief Russell is here. He's in Chief, this. Thank you very much. You and all your. Lee. No, I, I also want to add and piggyback on that. It, it was a difficult week for the chief. He had family in the Virgin Islands in Florida yeah. that were affected by the hurricane. And uh, I just wanted to recognize that. We had numerous people here affected by the hurricanes. Uh, next on the agenda is the Johnson County Education Research Triangle. Trustee Lindstrom. Yeah, a real brief report. Um, uh, good news, uh, sales receipts for, uh, for Johnson County were up 4% in uh, the month of August. In, it results in uh, $1,570,814.78 being directed uh, to the Johnson County Education Research Triangle. We don't meet again until uh, November, um, November 7th, uh, Monday, November 6th, I'm sorry, at the uh, KU Clinical Research Center, which is 4350 Shawnee Mission Parkway in Fairway, and uh, that meeting is open to the public. Thank you, Dave. Questions? Foundation, oh, Jerry thought I skipped him. Kansas Association of Community College Trustees. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I erroneously, erroneously double booked events for that Saturday and uh, could not attend uh, KACCT, but Dr. McLeod attended in our absence and uh, has a 60 second commercial on what happened there. Uh, I, I learned a great deal uh, about the placement of Johnson County within the uh, sphere and universe of the community colleges uh, in the great state of Kansas and enjoyed the hospitality of the, the lovely, lovely people of downtown El Dorado, Kansas. Uh, it was uh, a learning opportunity to hear about some of the things that were brought to um, to kind of argue and discuss and debate. A lot of the discussions centered around concurrent enrollment partnerships um, and the state's inquiry uh, into how we all run our concurrent enrollment partnerships, uh, as well as <clears throat> the, the resurgence of something I think that you, you guys have dealt with several times, the, the, the questioning of the usefulness of our community college boundaries and the, uh, and the advent of a possible statewide middle levy, which not only did the interesting thing is I didn't even have to speak up on our behalf to say we think that's a bad idea because three of the presidents went, well, Johnson County already thinks that's a bad idea, and so we need to probably just let that go. 
<laughs> so it was kind of nice that we've established ourselves as thinking that this is, you know, we, we seem to have a pretty good following and a, and a good standing uh, among the other presidents. Uh, it, was a, it was a good time. Uh, and I enjoyed, uh, yet again, getting to watch and, and listen to um, our uh, State Department of Ed talk about K-12 uh, and its funding and the way in which things uh, work. Uh, as Randy Watson got up and, and spoke to us about his Kansas CAN program. I did, however, and this, this is something I think uh, Mr. Carter could maybe take forward for us, um, come to understand that a huge part of the Kansas CAN uh, movement is that it will now use, uh, whether you are still enrolled, engaged, or have completed a two-year uh, degree or certificate as the benchmark for K-12 and whether they have been successful. Now, if you couple that with the fact that our four years look at the transfer rate and being able to take our students with us, with them uh, as very important. I think this now formally makes the community college sector the most underfunded and yet most responsible <laughs> education stratum in the entire state of Kansas. I, I would good news. Uh, that actually is good news. <laughs> Make sure. Just as a follow up, Mr. Chair, I, I will be attending ACCT starting the, uh, Sunday through next Thursday, and. Um, like Dr. McLeod has said, we, we think nationally this is a really a prime time for the community college network, 1,108 of us in North America, uh, to, to again take a step forward in being the affordable alternative uh, for students of all ages to uh, work on degrees or certificates. Um, one of the uh, items that I'm looking forward to, we'll have a panel discussion on one of our sessions that I think includes seven representatives from the accreditation uh, uh, networks in the country. And as was referenced earlier, our, our accreditation with the Higher Learning Commission is coming up next spring, I guess February, somewhere in there. And uh, so it'll be interesting to hear these seven the, panel members. Excuse me, Doctor. The visit's in April. April. Uh, these seven accreditation uh, representatives talk about uh, the issues facing them. I believe that DACA will be a discussion uh, item. And uh, again, uh, I, I think it's healthy for us to be able to understand uh, all points of view. It could be, and I know that when we had our board retreat in July, the uh, future of Hispanic students was of concern uh, at that time before any announcements and could be attributed to the uh, decline we see in our Hispanic students. So. It'll be an interesting topic, but I think the time is right for community colleges nationwide and in the state of Kansas and in Johnson County to step forward and say, here we are, we're an alternative, a good alternative. Uh, and I have one other comment to make uh, in regard to um, the great news you mentioned, Dr. Sopcich, about Graham and other students. Uh, I know that InfoServe is pretty much internally. And when I look at that and I think about, uh, and maybe this is a challenge to Chris and team, but why couldn't we have a system like that for county residents so that, you know, effective businesses get on your web page without invite, but if there was a way that we could promote and market the great success stories we have to the residents of Johnson County, um, I, I think that would be interesting to see. And, and I, I, know, I know less about technology than I do about AAA ratings, and so I would uh, let uh, the experts figure that out, but there must be a way we can communicate to every resident in this county and not wait for them to go on our system, but for us to give them the information, because we have great stories to tell every day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question for the judges. Yes. Um, Mr. Gray. For the do judges. We, <laughs> <laughs> do we... Uh, um, I imagine we do a lot of social media outreach, and that, uh, in my experience, has essentially replaced a lot of television and even radio outreach. What, what can, can we just have like a 60-second overview of what we do? Because I can sense he, Dr. Cooks, we spent four years with him, his tension and un, un, uneasiness about what we're doing. Uh, and I, I have some confidence we are. I'm not trying to contradict him. It's a valid concern. Yeah. You asked him this in social? Yeah, like on, let's say Facebook. Let's just focus on Facebook. What are we doing on Facebook? I'll speak social in general. So when I see social media, I want to talk about Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, those three platforms specifically. 
college. So how the college has handled that here over the past, I would say, year and a half, it is a platform to tell stories. It isn't, um, there's events on there, you know, we talk about certain events, but it really is, uh, to your point, it is kind of that, that 24 hour news cycle. Um, it cuts through the email and it gives people relevant information. So there is a lot of sharing, not just countywide, but you know, nationwide that we do um, with our followers. And we went around, I'm quoting on this, 15, 20,000 followers on Twitter. Um, Facebook, we have you know, 7,000, 8,000. So how we get news out, um, it, it, it is very difficult, I'll tell you, to, to send an email out or to have a server or something to really get those stories out there. It's really finding those varied platforms that the audiences are on today and distributing that um, in a purposeful manner. And it's repetition, too. Um, I think the storytelling, we're good. We can get better. Um, trust me, across to your point, too, we are we are looking and actually we'll have a member on my team here two weeks. Um, that is really going to be more dedicated in, in, in that position. It's not a new position. I just kind of re, reposition the position that was open. That is more of the title of the social media and content coordinator. And that person basically is a storyteller. It's a storyteller on a digital platform. It, and that's really kind of how we get those uh, successful out in that fashion. Does that answer your question? It does. I mean, I think to Dr. Cook's point, my concern, particularly uh, on the 35 corridor and in the northern precincts, that we have a tremendous amount of poverty that, you know, they don't walk around with data phones. Sure. So I think Dr. Cook's point is excellent and valid and really relevant to the core of our mission. So I thank you for that. I know it is extremely difficult right now as we're transitioning uh, between mediums, I think, that are capturing people's attention. And, that, and that's the beauty, too, and I'll add one more quick comment. Um, that there isn't just one platform anymore. Um, you can't just be on TV, you can't just be on radio. In the past, that's, that's really kind of how you got your message out, and it has to be integrated. And you've got to be on, you know, five, six, seven screens, to your point, you know, if they do have phones or they don't, um, that's really not the case, is just people's attention spans, whether it doesn't matter if it's economic or socioeconomic um, conditions, You've got to be in a lot of different places um, pushing that message and pushing that story. And I do think the college does a very good job of that to really position us in that background. Uh, Trustee Cross, uh, Chris is working on a presentation that I think would be of interest to everyone. It will provide an overview of what our um, media is, including social and your more conventional media with regards to television, radio, and print. So um, that will be coming down, down the path pretty soon. Mr. Chair, just, just to react to Trustee Cross's comment, I don't, I don't mean to imply that I'm under tension or uneasy. I think we do a terrific job on this campus communicating to the network on campus. I'm just saying let's extend that to the residents of the county. <coughs> Well, what we try to do is be good and then be better. And that's what you're talking about, Chris, is taking it to the next level. So. All right, Trustee uh, Ingram, Foundation Report. Yes, on August 23rd, the Foundation held its first social of the year in the Healthcare Simulation Center. Nursing faculty were on hand to show Foundation members the state-of-the-art facility and how it is used in the college's nursing curriculum. During the event, we also celebrated the launch of the Safe Finger created by nursing professor Kathy Carver and Dr. Zamorowski. The Safe Finger Stick is the first product conceived, funded, developed, and brought to market by Johnson County Community College. To date, we have received almost 100 orders for the Safe Finger from educational institutions, large and small, and internationally, including Australia and Canada. Proceeds from the sales of the Safe Finger will fund Johnson County Community College nursing scholarships. On September the 6th, the Foundation held its annual scholarship celebration luncheon in the Rainier Center to recognize this year's Foundation scholarship winners. Over 200 people attended and wonderful student stories were shared. A special thanks to Pam Vassar and Paul Kyle for leading this event. The Foundation Board of Directors met on September the 19th and the Foundation's fiscal year 2017 financial report was reviewed. Total revenues were $6.7 million, which is an increase of nearly $4 million over 2016. The Foundation's endowment is at its strongest position ever at over $32 million. Over $485,000 has been raised for some enchanted evening to date. The gala will be held on November the 11th, 2017 at the Overland Park Marriott. Sponsorships are wrapping up with just a handful of tables available and still for purchase. Calendar reminders include October 15th, the Lace Up for Learning, 5K at Johnson County Community College. October 24th, we have the Foundation Annual Dinner in Yardley Hall. And again, some enchanted evening on November the 11th. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Questions? 
excuse me, I would like to recognize Kate Allen. Those are incredible numbers, Kate. Congratulations. Um, uh, how much of the safe finger are those revenues? I mean, how much? <laughs> did, have they, has it hit yet? All the revenues coming in from the safe finger? We're hoping to break even. <laughs> Thank That's you. a spirit. Great, great job. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Kate, great job. for your leadership Thanks, on the foundation. Uh, the board, we're ready for the consent agenda. The consent agenda is a, a number of routine and consensus items that have been, uh, that are typically considered collectively and approved in a single motion. Any member of the board may request that an item on the consent agenda be pulled and be debated and, and uh, acted on separately. Are there any items that anybody would like to discuss or comment on or vote on separately from tonight's consent agenda? If not, I'd accept a motion to approve the consent agenda as set forth in the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say yes. Yes. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, we have no executive session tonight. Before I ask for a motion to, to, for, to adjourn, we do have a retreat scheduled for Saturday, October 7th at the Wiley Hospitality and Culinary Academy beginning at 8 o'clock a.m. That is, a, as all our meetings are, a public meeting. So if you want to come to that, uh, October 7th, 8 a.m. at the Wiley Hospitality and Culinary Academy. Yes, sir. For the good of the order, Mr. Chair, I'd just like to comment, though I disagree from time to time with Trustee Cook, I do respect and admire him and his dedication to the community college movement. I just want to make a formal, adequate record. No matter how uneasy he appears sometimes. <laughs> well, I was joking. I know you were. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Clarification accepted. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say yes. Aye. Opposed no. We are adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>